Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Journal Club hosted by the International Society for the Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect. We will be talking today about the 30th anniversary of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which has, over the past 30 years, focused the world on protecting and safeguarding children and adolescents and ensuring their healthy development. Christine Weckerly, Editor-in-Chief of Child Abuse and Neglect, will highlight a surge of research in Canada in particular, which has directed attention to the need for youth participation in developing their own Charter of Rights, with youth expressing that they view their rights, that their rights include not only environmental and climate issues, but also education, peace, and mental wellness. This webinar will profile some Canadian developments, highlight work yet to do, and give an overview of special upcoming content from the journal on the UNCRC and violence prevention. Right now, we, I have everyone on mute to avoid background noise. We welcome you to please enter any questions or comments you have for Dr. Weckerly in the questions box throughout the presentation. She will answer any questions at the end as time permits. Dr. Christine Weckerly is an associate professor in pediatrics and associate member of the Offord Center for Child Studies at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. She is editor-in-chief of Child Abuse and Neglect, the International Journal, as well as founding editor of the Open Access Journal, International Journal of Child and Adolescent Resilience. She co-authored the book, Child Maltreatment, Second Edition, which targets those whose practice engages them in the issues of child maltreatment. Her research focuses on youth who have had adverse childhood experiences and their current mental health and resilience. Chris, we thank you so much for being with us today and for your many contributions to the field of child abuse and neglect. Now I will turn it over to you. One moment, please. Hi everyone. Um, please let us know if uh, there's any uh, issues in how you see the screen. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, perhaps, uh, Heather, you could let me know if that's an issue. Yeah, no, that's okay. We can see your screen great. Okay, super. So, we are here in the uh, CRC 30th anniversary week, having celebrated it on November 20th. And really, I think the big news story is a celebration of youth, youth celebrating um, their empowerment to be our leaders and advocates, moving rights forward, uh, being particularly well attuned to science and uh, taking action and just getting things done that the adults haven't been able to do. So our ability to support youth is what's so important at this point in our um, time in 2019. And I'm just trying to uh, move this forward. There we go, okay. So, I think it's appropriate that we start off this uh, talk about the UNCRC with a youth voice. And Millie Bobby Brown is a uh, actor on Stranger Things and the youngest uh, ambassador. Um, and she delivered a speech at uh, the UN um, as part And I'm just going to show you this. Um, take it. She talks about her experience, personal experience of bullying, and how that is such a significant issue for so many um, of uh, our young people. Of fear, bullying, and harassment. It can bring people together. Oh. It can be a place of love and support. Is this working? Somewhere in the world. Yes, Chris, now, try to bring it back to the beginning of the video. She's scared. I want to show vulnerable. only at this point. Oh, okay, thank you. My message to her is this. You are not alone. 
there are people who care about you and there are people who will listen if you reach out for help. You have rights. In my role as a Goodwill Ambassador, I will continue talking about this wherever I go. I will take every opportunity to spread the word about how we can end bullying online and off. But I'm not alone about speaking about children's rights. I'm joined by tens of thousands of other young people from every part of the world demanding to be heard. In September, in this very building, Greta Thunberg, a 16-year-old girl, told world leaders an uncomfortable truth. She told them that the adults of the world have failed to act on climate change. And she's carrying that message around the world. And now, Greta's message is being echoed every Friday when thousands of young people leave their classrooms to protest the world's inaction to climate change. Young people like her are shouting for world leaders to hear, to listen, and to act. Every one of you here today can be the loudspeaker that turns our voices into real change, into policies, programs, laws and investments that keep children safe, that make our world a better, healthier, stronger place for all. 30 years ago, Audrey Hepburn reminded us the power of the rights protected in the convention. These rights matter, they are eternal, but they are not automatic. It's up to all of us to bring these rights to life. On this World Children's Day, let's be mindful of Audrey's words and carry her commitment forward. The children of the world are asking you to stand with us, listen to us, and renew your promises to the world's children. Thank you. Thank you, wherever you are. So that was really great, a uh, very articulate uh, way to introduce the UNCRC and to call upon countries to really look at their policies. Because if something's not in policy, then it, it there's not that accountability in in systems and governmental systems and governments are required to report back about their progress and some countries are identified as pathfinder countries canada being one of them where we're tasked to come up with solutions that ensure that these rights are being met so uh people probably do realize that the Convention on the Rights of the Child was adopted in 1989 uh, on November 20th, and the U.S. has not ratified it, um, given that their policy conflicts with um, the issues around separation of unauthorized migrant children from their parents. And that is uh, clearly a, a topical uh, child rights and child development, child health issue that has been in and out of the news. In 2019, UNICEF uh, ChildRightsConnect.org has released this graphic that you see, which is a child-friendly UNCRC document. And one of the very, very important things is that children do know their rights, and they are aware that the you know virtually all countries of the world have signed on to support these rights and uh, rights education uh, in schools, in families, in communities is so important and this kind of a tool may help to um, have children and their families and their communities understand just the importance of say 24 that you have a right to health, a water, food and a safe environment. Uh, those kinds of things all go together and I'll be uh, talking a bit more about that intersectionality. There are optional protocols within the UNCRC uh, that sp sp spoke to uh, protecting particularly vulnerable uh, situations for children such as armed conflict, um, child sexual exploitation, on or offline, and uh, ECPAT International has been really leading the efforts in collaborating with Interpol and the Innocenti Center to uh, advance uh, how we can protect in the many different ways 
from t uh, tourism to uh, orphanages and the online environment, as well as having opportunities for children to make uh, complaints that would be in policies when you have an office of the advocate, child advocate, and which we have in Canada, although in Ontario they got rid of uh, the office of the advocate, a, a move backwards. So with all these uh, rights, you know, we have some move forward, some move backward, but uh, if we're all having our eyes on the rights and we we make rights part of our regular discourse in our media and in our education at all levels, uh, in how we train professionals, that this is a, a really a valuable ongoing long-term agenda for us. Some of these intersectional issues, like the graphics to the right, you have uh, things like um, social identities, including gender identities, and how that may relate to various other systems. Um, so some of the facts that relate to intersectional issues are that children from poorest households have uh, much more disadvantage coming to them from a number of sources that contribute to their mortality, early mortality um, before age five. And that immuniz immunization rates are higher where you have urban cities versus rural communities likely due to access to healthcare and physicians, et cetera. Um, but there's still many uh, children who are not um, vaccinated in that is uh, re relevant to understanding we can prevent those diseases and we always want to be on the side of prevention rather than have to respond to the rights infraction. Uh, we want to be rights promotion. Uh, the number of kids growing up in urban cities has increased and so that'll bring concerns around um, health and safety and in some countries uh, the poorest population of girls may be even more at risk for child marriage than 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, we may not understand the way things intersect, but if you have an environmental disaster event, then in a community that doesn't have very much resources, one of their strategies may be early marriage of a girl because of this, um, you know, flattening of of uh, resources from an environmental disaster or environmental uh, climate event. So it's just keeping in mind that while you have various uh, rights, that these rights really kind of do work together and the uh, most vulnerable are those that maybe have uh, most uh, adverse situations and perhaps uh, um, policies and government not in place. So the move to progress is to be mindful of these pillars, uh, things like accountability, which is strengthening the rule of law, participation we've talked about to ensure that youth are represented, whether you're doing online polling, broad scale online polling, or having youth advisory councils at every level, that youth are at the table when decisions are being made about them. Uh, non-discrimination so we can ensure uh, uh, equality and countering discrimination and racism and that's part and parcel of moving towards health equity. Um, in terms of development, you know, how do we advance sustainable development? How do we uh, uh, learn from indigenous models of living with the land, living on the land um, in a way that's respectful and maintains our resources because we have an attachment and an appreciation of the fact that our bodies are made of a high percentage of water and therefore if we're respecting ourselves we're respecting water uh, for instance peace and security so this is really in relation to how we are treating children and ensuring that their safeguarding is in place in, in situations of conflict, uh, refugee status, 
um, things like that. And the mechanisms and what, how we have uh, mechanisms in place to increase implementation, uh, share knowledge, and um, really value the agency of youth as well. Part of the research that uh, I've been involved with, and we in Canada have a team grant in Boys and Men's Health. And uh, the question we ask on some of the non-discrimination part is um, wanting to fully move forward, of course, with uh, girls' protection from violence and supporting gender equity for females. But we have to also ask the question, what about the boys? Are we doing some discrimination when we don't recognize that in Canada, one in 20 boys experience sexual abuse? Um, and how are we able in our interventions, our prevention programming, to incorporate what we know about gender? So we have an app uh, called JoyPop that's intended to build daily resilience, and we incorporated the research from gaming that Tetris type games are very useful for dampening anxiety and addressing PTSD symptoms. And being in a gaming approach that that is more relevant to males, so we incorporated that. We also know that males who have been uh, experienced child sexual abuse are much, much less likely to uh, disclose and do help seeking so in our app, we had all the help seeking numbers already handy, so it's easy access. And the, um, the side piece at a larger level is that we need to eradicate harmful stereotypes and this idea that boys don't cry, that boys have to be tough, they're all about agency, um, is maybe the hardest lesson to unlearn and that we need to be able to teach boys that uh, you know, you're responsible for regulating your emotions, which means dealing with them and managing them, not suppressing them or stuffing them down. Want to, throughout this talk, highlight some features uh, from our journal, Child Abuse and Neglect. And um, certainly, uh, if I'm on Instagram and Twitter, at Dr. Weckerly, and from time to time, I'll be fe I feature articles from the journal, especially those that are open access. And uh, so I invite you to follow me. Um, some of our work in the child sexual abuse domain uh, would be on our website, youthresilience.net. Uh, currently available is a special issue on child sexual abuse disclosures by Dr. Alagia and Dr. Colin Vizina, who are the guest editors. Um, and one of the articles that are uh, an open access art article is the one by Ben Matthews, who really looks at those issues around laws, uh, how laws can be facilitative of rights. Um, from their Australian Government Royal Commission inst into institutional responses to child sexual abuse, a huge uh, undertaking they found that the majority of those who came to the commission to tell their story of CSA first disclosed as adults. And that's something that we have found repeatedly in the literature that uh, there seems to be, uh, you know, it, the difficulty of disclosure means a delay or maybe not even telling anyone about it. And some research shows that if you have a more um, uh, closer to the event delay, you have better outcomes. Uh, there's many reasons and when we talk about that gender harmful stereotypes is that um, males may be, uh, have fears of how they may be perceived. Uh, females are tend to be, uh, have male perpetrators, but boys have both male and female perpetrators. And in some countries, if there's a law against homosexuality, you may be feared as the victim that you would be and have a charge. So some of these issues are discussed in a um, upcoming article by um, uh, Mark Cavanaugh that uh, you'll be able to see likely within the next month or so. 
in Ben's analysis, there are some criminal law duties that can be enacted, can become policy um, that are protective of children. So a duty to require all re adults to report the reasonable beliefs of uh, CSA uh, or a broader duty to report a uh, criminal offense, a uh, duty to report uh, applied to a position of a person in authority, so that even if in some cases there's laws around people who, professionals who deal with kids, if you have a, a judge or uh, a physician that whose practice does not involve kids, um, they may have their own professional body um, requirements, but this would put it a little bit higher. So the duty to report that is applied to professionals who work with children are in a number of countries, but not the dominant number of countries in the world. Um, so uh, that's something that maybe countries can be looking at as whether that would be useful for them um, in their monitoring data collection, helping them help helping to guide them. And then there's various duties in civil law that can be facilita facilitative. So um, the way to access the article, you have the link there. So challenges to progress are things around threats to child survival, lack of immunization, the climate change is so topical, lack of universal education, um, lack of universal healthcare, uh, child marriage, gender disparities, and urbanization. The accomplishments that we've seen uh, are in uh, a number of areas, and I'd like to spend some time to go through those. So this is from the UK where they track over time how they have implemented uh, a um, formal uh, professional approach to child rights in establishing a children's minister and then a children's commissioner. And I think Canada is trying to follow this pathway. Uh, then there is a community of practice at the end, the child rights uh, impact assessment is a community of practice to be able to have communication with others around how are we supporting rights. In terms of education in 2020, um, they've moved through various educations um, milestones and in 2020 they're going to ensure that there's um, relationship-based education for health and sexual well-being um, going forward. Uh, certainly I think the UK is quite aware of the, the online um, child sexual abuse and the pornography issues and those we have to just really deal with um, because it's, can pro, it's proliferating at such a high rate. In terms of how they treat juvenile offenders, uh, in 2015 they established that they need to be treated as children, uh, so they uh, wouldn't be thrown in a holding cell with a number of adults, um, uh, potential offenders, and that uh, their arrests have dropped down. In terms of getting to this, uh, the interconnection, Article 24 of the CRC is that I, they have the right to good quality health care, to clean water and good food. And how these all do come together, and particularly in Canada, this is really highlighted in um, our Indigenous populations on reserve. Uh, I think the world will be surprised to know that you can have where I am at, a center, McMaster University, Hamilton, Ontario, running water, water treatment, and then a 30 minute drive to for, uh, Six Nations Reserve, majority of the households do not have access to running water. The cost to put in a water line to their treatment center is exorbitant and is borne by the individual who would occupy that house. And that there's contaminations from industry in their waters when they rely on the waters for plants as medicine, for fish as food, uh, for, you know, game and a meat and in ceremony. So uh, I think this is such a, uh, helps to explain what you're gonna see next about Canada. Um, 
certainly environmental impacts uh, push people to uh, accept what is very much not that right to water. Um, so if you have a dried area, this is a picture of India. Um, they are having a, a water crisis because of the scant rainfall. And without functioning hand pumps and bore wells, the villagers don't have much choice other than to drink contaminated water. And of course, we know this is gonna affect infants and uh, expectant mothers so much so and um, breast milk, etc. So when people see Canada, I googled Canada, and these are the images uh, we got. Um, looks like there's no people in Canada, but we are have a lot of land to people, and there's water and lots of trees, and and uh, so this is our view. And it is true, there are beautiful places in Canada to visit. Some of my favorite places are in the Banff area, um, but and in Quebec. So there's just a lot of wonderful sites, but uh, the story is a little bit more um, complex. So I'm gonna play you this video. Here we are in Hamilton, Ontario, 33 kilometers away in Six Nations. Families do not have running water. A mother is anxious about when the next water delivery truck will be making their delivery. A child is refusing to go to school, ashamed that they did not get to shower this morning. It's 2019 and companies are exploiting the land of all of its precious resources and selling them back to consumers in the same way that humans are being stolen and trafficked by exploiters for profit. Women, especially Indigenous women, youth traveling to big cities, those living close to the industries and LGBTQ2S plus individuals are more likely to be victimized. It's 2019 and a two-spirit youth is walking hours down a dirt road to access healthcare from a provider that acknowledges their identity. Sexually victimized youth are searching for support from clinicians who do not question their gender identity or sexual orientation. It's 2019 and providers do not have the cultural competency skills or training required to recognize and respond safely to gender-based violence or understand the intersectional issues affecting families today. The social determinants of health include access to water, gender identity, and gender-based violence. The 2030 Sustainable Development Goals call upon Pathfinder countries to find solutions. Canada has been identified as a Pathfinder country, yet progress has been marginal. How do we develop training and interventions that respond to these intersectional issues? How do we promote resilience in health equity, gender, and water in 2020? So we're having a, a conference about these kinds of youth resilience and rights issues in this intersectional way in at, at McMaster in Hamilton. It's actually going to be held at the Art Gallery of Hamilton in March. And if you have an interest or want to submit a poster, uh, please check it out at youthresilience.net. So when Canadians are asked how our children are doing, they, we think that our children must rank in the top 10 of countries. Uh, and quite shockingly, they don't. And you can see the ranking on the, that are in the UNICEF report cards the, on the Index of Child and Youth Wellbeing um, from 2007 uh, and 2010, really, high of 10 and 12 to 2017, where we're ranked 25th in the world. And um, there's a number of issues that go into that, but uh, you certainly couldn't underscore enough the uh, treatment of Indigenous children, um, the over-representation of Indigenous children in the child welfare system uh, with the work of Cindy Blackstock, who will be contributing an article. Um, the Jordan's principle that, that says 
kids need to have their chronic health needs met you know, immediately, not until the federal government and provincial governments can work out funding about uh, getting, uh, san you know, new sanitized tubes for use. And um, you can certainly Google Jordan's principles if you want to learn more about that. So we have a lot of work to do in Canada. Um, we have some targets to do, reduce inequality and poverty by 60% in 2030. We are um, tasked to have an investment minimally of 6% uh, towards early child uh, education, early child care to support those early years. Uh, we have a long way to go to pursue reconciliation with our First Peoples in terms of uh, supporting what is resilience uh, for uh, Indigenous persons um, in their governance and uh, culturally based services. And we need to put children and youth in the decision-making spaces. Um, I like this quote, Earth does not belong to us, we belong to Earth. Uh, you know, we take memories, but we leave nothing but footprints from cheap Seattle. And uh, what Canada has worked on and has achieved in 2018 is a Canadian Children uh, Charter of Rights, um, spearheaded by uh, Sarah Austin. And these are the nine rights that uh, children uh were polled in various kind of town hall meetings and meetings with government persons, had their voice around what they cared about, the Canada that they imagined. And it was child participation and youth engagement, high quality health care, and having things like federal standards for mental health and physical health, uh, reduced substance use. And again, that's like having standards, national standards, uh, for school curricula, um, ending discrimination, exclusion, and bullying. We have a strong um, research and advocacy network called PrevNet in Canada, doing great work in bullying and extending that to the adolescent dating violence prevention um, issue. A stable, secure future. So really, what are we doing to safeguard the environment? How are we maintaining our right to clean water? How are we extending um, that right to everyone so they're not on boil water advisories? Um, our high quality education and uh, celebrating that Canada is a very diverse place and we want to continue to celebrate our linguistic and cultural diversity um, as well as specifically reconciliation. And I'm going to show this video Hopefully, very short one. Today, there are six million kids in Canada. And depending on the family, city, or province we are born into, some of us go far in life and some of us are left behind. Can you imagine what would happen if every child had a loving family to raise them? Every child had access to good quality medical care. Every child had clean water and nutritious food. Every child had a safe place to call home. Every child could grow up free from discrimination. Every child had a mentor. Every child could participate in decisions that affect their lives. Every child had hope for the future. What if we stop imagining? What if we stop making empty promises? What if we make a plan and follow through with it? Every Canadian has a shared responsibility in raising our nation's children. Children in Canada need us to work together. That's why we're creating Canada's Children's Charter. And use of bombers when to go to the ads. Go to childrenfirstcanada.com. Tell us what it will take for every child in Canada to achieve their full potential. Together. 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 We can make Canada the best place in the world for kids to grow up. Okay. Um, so they there was a very successful campaign on uh, 
the UNCRC 30th day. Um, wonderful that corporations step up to the plate and tell us uh, help to uh, raise funds uh, around the hashtag 8 million reasons. And uh, TELUS has also partnered with our Child Welfare Foundation and just, you know, really wonderfully um, is supporting youth who are transitioning out of child welfare, um, youth in care, tr transitioning to independence um, in our systems, your support to age 18. And uh, youth who are transitioning out are able to have a two year free cell phone data plan so that we are leveling the field because of the internet is and access to the internet is such a great great equalizer um, in providing information opportunities and uh, that's a really great thing and in january bell canada runs a let's talk campaign where they raise funds for youth mental health so there's many great combinations of corporations and non-government organizations, uh, government investments in research. Uh, there's um, wonderful, huge investment in Indigenous-led networks. So there's lots of uh, good work happening, and hopefully all this together will help us to raise our ranking in, in the world. In terms of talking about some of the special issues, uh, there's two special issues that will be coming out in the journal. Uh, the first issue is a more o a global issue or overall issue on the uh, 30th anniversary of the CRC with articles uh, addressing things like uh, how are we addressing the agenda on children with disabilities, healthcare and public health approach to rights, uh, the need for a global analysis of child sexual exploitation, the global challenge of neglect of children, how are we developing youth participation, youth uh, child participation and youth empowerment. So this particular issue, the articles are pretty much together and we will hope that it comes out early in 2020 for you to see. And the second issue is going to be celebrating is Canada's 45th year and the uh, the CRC must be in my typo there on 35 but uh, maybe looking ahead to the 35th anniversary what can we be um, doing in terms of uh, really focusing on prevention and child protection so uh, part of the intent is to look at the WHO Inspire strategy as well as trauma-informed care and region-specific issues such as Syrian refugee children in Turkey, uh, how is uh, rights being advanced there. And uh, there, if you particularly uh, have some interest in submissions for that uh, issue, I would suggest that you connect with our associate editor Sarah Brown and if you go to our website you find all those emails um, to do that. So there's great things coming ahead in terms of special issues. There's a call right now out for a special issue on strengthening data and evidence to realize child rights of uh, um, street involved children and uh, this Guest editors are Claudia Kappa and Lisette Flemings, and uh, the intent is to be able to um, look at these issues and what reliable data and evidence we have about children in street situations, and uh, what are the strategies um, that have been uh, advanced. So this call is open and uh, you have until January 15th, but if you have some interest in submitting, I would suggest you email Claudia Kappa or email me at uh, chris.weckerly, W-E-K-E-R-L-E at gmail.com uh, or my McMaster email, wecker, C W E K E R C at mcmaster.ca and uh, I'm happy to entertain your questions. So that leaves us with about 15 minutes to respond to questions and to say thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you 
to all the children, youth, families, communities, practitioners, professionals, uh, governmental persons for all your dedicated work. Uh, we're all on the same child team in the sky and uh, I'm very much uh, uh, enthusiastic about the optimism we should have going forward with child rights. Thanks, Heather. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Um, for sharing that information with us today. I'm going to take over the screen here. Give us just a second. And just a reminder um, to the audience, if you have any questions about anything that Dr. Weckerly um, talked about or uh, or anything <laughs> at all, just type them in the questions box and we'll be happy to address those. Um, so as we're giving the audience a minute to, to come up with some questions, um, I wanted to ask Chris um, about the the Children's Charter in Canada. Do you know if, if other countries are doing anything similar and do you see this as a model for other countries? I think the goal is to have like a governmental office and representative that carries children issues forward no matter what the changing governments are. And I think that um, that is achieved with a Children's Commissioner. And the Children's Commissioner needs a mandate to go forward, and that mandate would be the Children's Charter of Rights. So this is really different than maybe other Charter of Rights and Freedoms that you may have in a country, because this is developed from children's voices. So I do think that it's a, it is a model um, where, uh, uh, you know, Input was sought in an online um, survey. Input was sought going to various, uh, like I said, town hall kind of events set up in different places around Canada. And uh, various youth champions showing diversity were included in um, giving the presentations at these events and engaging in a very kind of conversational way. Um, the W2A network uh, had fac facilitated a lot of these uh, events. And so over a period of about uh, a year or a year and a half, uh, then you arrive with, you know, the distilled top rights that kids are saying they're demanding. And climate change is in there, as we can see, that makes sense for, um, you know, what we're understanding where the world's at from a scientific perspective. So that's, uh, I think it is a great model. And I think it's a great initiative because it is a very formalized way of having like almost kids voting when they can't vote in elections. Um, but right. Do you, along those lines, um, are, are there any particular challenges that you see to to youth participation? I know at ISPCAN we are always looking for ways to involve youth in, in our projects and um, have had some challenges. Yeah, I mean, you there are, you know, various grassroots youth groups and youth agencies that are great partners. So in Canada, any youth, there's a network of youth who have gone through the child welfare system. And so there are various, um, there are also youth who are clear leaders in Canada on climate change, like on Pelletier, Pelletier and uh, Mikasa Looking Horse and uh, Cody Looking Horse. So, you know, it's also, it's a multiple strategy of attack you know tapping those youth who are already out there in the front um, champions you have uh, earth guardians in the United States for instance and uh, so tapping champions uh, who are already connected to youth networks and having them uh, you know co-arrange uh, youth engagement also having paid positions within your boards or um, within your committees for a number of youth is really important because uh, they're uh, or an honorarium system that they are remunerated um, and this is something that they can utilize for their 
you know, CV and education building. Uh, so it's really hand-in-hand uh, -hand with providing concrete youth opportunities would be some of the strategies. Okay, those are some great suggestions. Um, here's a question uh, about children and youth um, who are not aware of their rights. How can we support children in understanding and actioning their rights? Yeah, well, there was that nice graphic that has uh, all the article, um, all the articles of the CRC in a bit more child-friendly language. Um, so there are various videos uh, on child rights um, that that you're able to use as a talking point and um, if you're you know can take it to your education system and say you know really at every grade can we have a talk about child rights and they certainly do want to have a talk about uh, the do's and don'ts of behaviors in a classroom and it's really important that kids understand this concept of rights and that they have rights so um, there's just various uh, existing curricula kinds of things on YouTube, on UNICEF channel, or United Nations channel, or WHO channel. Um, and uh, I just really want to advocate that we are very quite active in our families, in our communities, in teaching kids their rights. Yes, and that would go across disciplines, I would imagine, not just in the school system, but you see a role for healthcare um, practitioners and social workers, et cetera, to be also getting that message across. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm teaching in the medical school undergraduate curriculum, and it would be wonderful to have, um, you know, a. Th there's a lot of competition for uh, what you can teach, and there's a lot of things that need to be taught, but to have a, you know, an action-oriented way of understanding so for us here at McMaster University, undergraduates could do a tour of Six Nations and have conversations that are so meaningful with elders who are so knowledgeable and have such great wisdom, um, sacred wisdom, but also great knowledge of the land and, and um, you know, basically indigenous science. So those kinds of exchange opportunities, I think, are really impactful because we can say kids are doers, but we still are also doers. And uh, getting out on onto the land and doing activities is a great way of learning. Yes. Um, here's a question. Um, how can we get ch children's rights issues into the political narration? Politicians worldwide don't care for child rights. Um, for example, children don't vote. So how do you see ways um, to, to get the message out or have it amplified in the political sphere? Yeah, I think that there was a great, you know, again in Canada around this um, energizing kids to uh, have their rights articulated. Just as you have debate in the debates, uh, and I saw this recently in the UK where they invited, uh, you know, youth advocates. Whenever you have a, like an election and debates, have those youth advocates to answer, ask questions of those politicians who want to get elected. You know, help to have, support youth to be in those audiences and to have that opportunity um, to, you know, create opportunities to meet uh, serving politicians one on one with the youth. Um, as an example, in the child uh, sexual exploitation. 12 female victims got together and went to the health minister in Canada to speak about their experience and that their sexual abuse was filmed and it's it, they're re-victimized because it just keeps popping up on different sites online. And uh, in an extreme cases, some, pe some per perpetrators who have uh, viewed those I images have tried to seek them out personally and track them down mm. um, so their rights infringements just ex expand and it's kind of rights infringements that never end and the health minister was you know because it was the first person experience with this group um, he took action and committed uh, dollars to the issue of online child sexual exploitation mm. so you know with adult support and preparation, children are, you know, 
the very best advocates. Yes, yes. Um, that's great to think about. And we have a question, <clears throat> excuse me, here from a member in Argentina. And she says um, she wants to congratulate Canada for their commitment to children and youth. Um, but in her country, Argentina, children's well being is not <clears throat> really a priority. Um, and she's asking, do you have any idea of South American situation? And do you think Canada's steps may give, th may have the same results in Latin America? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, destabilization and um, people stepping into leadership positions who were not duly elected and um, really having non-rights oriented views and statements. But that doesn't, you know, the, the value of social media is that doesn't stop from grassroots or, or campaigns happening um, uh, to put that awareness and continue to put pressure. Um, we don't ever want kids to do anything um, that would put them in harm's way. Uh, but there are ways to maybe take that campaign online mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, call out other countries to support and help and form partnerships with youth groups in other countries um, between, say, Argentina's youth uh, groups and other countries' youth groups to be able to have that um, solidarity be, and to be able if you're in some ways to hold the country accountable because they signed that UNCRC they signed it they're a signatory country they signed it so they have to follow through and just they have to you know it's on them to explain how they are being um, responsible with rights because they signed it right. you know and sometimes low tech is high tech there's a strong indigenous advocate in the United States who puts um, facts, rights violation facts on trains that mm. move around the country. So I'm, I, I'm also talking about like media and internet and social media, but sometimes low tech is high tech. Right. Right. Um, <clears throat> you talked about challenges um, to progress for the UNCRC, and we've got a, a member here that's asking about um, specifically low-income countries um, where parents are very poor and marginalized and can't fight for children's rights um, as well as they would like. And he says, what mechanism should exist in government systems to support these challenged populations, and how can UNCRC and agencies help support implementation of child rights in these very poor areas. Yeah, well, again, it comes back to that country signed off on it. So you have a duty to respond to the rights of um, the most vulnerable in your country. So it's, again, putting the pressure onto the government to say, like, you signed this, mm -hmm. and what are you doing? Uh, what are your, you know, advertising the um, progress and the lack of progress and pushing for, um, you know, those advocate offices and those advocate positions. Um, you know, there's various ways of doing a groundswell uh, uh, of advocacy. There's online, uh, um, there's an online uh, pledge system where you can sign uh, sign a petition online petition system and um, really putting forward you know the kids voices and their real stories I think uh, of their hardship because when something goes viral then you know the world turns to that country and to that population right so is, um, what are the systems of accountability for countries that have signed onto the UNCRC? Are there, are, are there ways that they're held accountable? Well, yes, they're supposed to report back mm -hmm. um, what they're doing. And if you go online, you'll see the specific indicators, um, like uh, in terms of, um, you know, child marriage or, and 
you know, sexual assaults should be dropped, those rates. So it tends to be kind of rates focused, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, if you're not monitoring on those, you're not going to be able to feed back. So, you know, collaborating with research and even approaching universities to do a research study that is from a community-based perspective um, may be also a tool to get some action happening. But, I mean, they are required to report back. Okay. So. Okay. Um, I think we've just about gotten through all the questions that have come in. I guess just in closing, um, you know, obviously there's probably a lot of variance in the progress that's been made across countries. Um, could you just kind of speak to what you think overall has been maybe the the greatest achievement or achievements of the UNCRC and perhaps the, the greatest area of challenge? Well, I think we're all in the place of the greatest area of challenge um, in terms of the climate, mm. because if we don't have an environment, we don't have clean water, um, then we don't have food access, uh, you know, all, all, other, it, all other rights kind of flow from those basic needs being met. Um, so I think we, you know, we have done well in terms of addressing diseases uh, with vaccinations and reducing young mortality. Um, on the violence side of things, I think we have done uh, well in creating frameworks and providing open access guidance like the M Health Gap, uh, the MH Gap, um, that helps um, professionals look at uh, evidence based solutions. Uh, we've been able to put out um, open access guidance kinds of documents. There's, you know, one on responding to child sexual abuse, there's uh, responding to exposure to domestic violence or IPV. And I think upcoming, um, McMaster has created a wonderful online learning tool called Vega Violence Evidence Action Guidance Project, Vega Project, that the Public Health Agency of Canada funded so that uh, individuals uh, working with kids um, and families will be able to really clearly understand how to recognize um, risk and maltreatment and to respond safely to it. So I think some of the training has been really great. Great, and we, for the audience, we will try to gather some of these um, resources. Is Vega V-E-G-A? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. um, and speaking of that, another, um, member did ask uh, you to maybe repeat how to how to reach out regarding that conference, Child Health, Water right. and Resilience, you mentioned. Yes. Um, uh, we are currently accepting posters. Um, so there is a link and a form for poster submissions. The actual registration for the conference will probably open in a couple of weeks. And all of that you can, you will see if you go to the website youth, resilience so y-o-u-t-h-r-e-s-i-l-i-e-n-c-e dot net okay i will just see oh well i don't have my screen <laughs> would you like would you yeah, like if me you want to pop, if you want to just pop my over to my screen okay one moment Yes, and if anyone has any questions about any other resources um, Dr. Weckerly has mentioned, please feel free to contact me at resources at ispcan.org and I will get you the information you're looking for. So this is the Resilience in Youth, Youth Rights and Resilience website. And right here where you see my cursor is 2020 Resilience Conference. So if you go to that, you will see more information about the conference. Um, and down here you see the program, uh, the poster submission, uh, the venue, and there will be soon a link for actual registration. So we'd love to see you and, and have your research represented. 
Wonderful. Okay, I'm gonna take the screen back just for our last couple slides here. Okay, so thank you so much, Chris, for sharing all this information with us today. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. I wanted to let you know that a copy, um, or I'm sorry, a, a recording of this webinar and um, a PDF version of the slides will be available on the ISPCAN website um, as soon as we can get those up. And we encourage you all to become members of ISPCAN so we can continue offering educational webinars like these in the future. If you are interested in presenting or have ideas for topics, please contact us at resources at ispcan.org. And again, if you have any questions about what Chris talked about today um, or the, the information or resources she mentioned, please contact me at this email here on the slide, resources at ispcan.org, and I will get you in touch um, with her or with the information you need. Um, so thank you all again for your time today and to Chris, and we hope you have a good day or night, depending on where you are. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.